viewers good morning welcome again to this segment in this segment we shall be talking about numbers then we we have to we will look at the various sets of numbers that we have in mathematics and in the world then we shall write them in set notations after writing them in set notations we shall also write them in interval notations all right let's begin the first number that we are going to be looking at is the whole numbers whole numbers the whole numbers can be represented by the letter w w and whole numbers in set notation in set notation we say that whole numbers whole number is the set of 0 1 2 3 4 so would you want me to keep listing 5 6 7 8 9 10 oh no if i keep listing then i would the whole board would be finished and probably the whole room will also be finished so i cannot keep on listing so i will use what we call in mathematics three dots i will use three dots and i will close the set now these three dots means ellipses the three dots means what we call ellipses in mathematics ellipses what does ellipses mean ad infinitum it keeps going and going and going and going ad infinitum well this is the latin word ad infinitum is a latin word or infinite is infinite indefinite that means it continues and continues and continues let me ask you this who can tell me the greatest number on earth is that one trillion what of 10 trillion what of 1000 trillion also who can tell me what is the least number on earth is that zero what of negative 0 0.1 what of negative 0 0.00001 so we don't have any greatest number in this world and we don't have any least number in this world so we will be making use of this ellipsis as we go on that means it keeps going and going and going now this is the set notation in interval notation if we have to write this in interval notation we will say that the W is from 0 is included up to positive infinity positive infinity looks like 8 that is bent upside down you know when you write the number 8 and then you bend it upside down as if it's lying down that is infinity now if you look at this interval notation you will notice this this means that it is included, closed. This is a closed interval. Which means that zero is included. You count zero. Infinity is represented in this form. Infinity. Remember, like I said, you don't have any greatest uh, number and you don't have any least number. So. Just like you have positive infinity, you also have negative infinity. So infinity is this symbol, and then this symbol means that it is open. Open interval. Now, for closed interval, this is the beginning. Beginning closed interval. And this is the ending. Let me call this, this is beginning, closed interval. And then you have the ending, closed interval. Ending, closed interval. Closed interval. 
like this. Now, this one is the ending open interval. Ending open interval. Now, if you have this, again, if you have this parenthesis, you have beginning closed interval. Beginning, I'm sorry, beginning open interval. Beginning open interval. So, you need to know these terms because, uh, terms, I said terms. Because in math, you will be, you will come across this. So, the, the parenthesis represents the open interval, while the brackets represent the closed interval. So, if you look at this, if you look at this right now, this is open interval at both ends, at both ends. You have the beginning open interval and the uh, ending open interval. If you look at this, this is closed interval at both ends. Closed interval at both ends. Now, what of this? Answer this yourself. I probably will not write it, but answer it yourself. This is open interval at one end, closed interval at the other end. That is this. And then what if you have this? This is closed interval at one end, open interval at the other end. So, <coughs> you will need uh, to know this as we move on. So, if you look at this case, the whole number in interval notation, you have that zero is closed, you have a closed interval at the beginning and the open interval at the end. Op closed interval at one end, open interval at the other end. So, zero is closed under this, which means that zero is included. If it is closed, that means it is included. If it is open, that means it is not included. Now, another thing to note. Note, if you have anything negative infinity and infinity, it's always going to be open. It's always going to be an open interval. Going to be an open interval. Anytime you have negative infinity and infinity, it's always going to be an open interval because, can you tell me why? This is because you don't have any least number in this world and you don't have any greatest number in this world. If you find out the greatest number, I would like to know. You, you tell me. Yeah, but that is why we open them at both ends. Alright, so if we have to list the examples of whole numbers, anything from 0 to infinity, 2, 5, 7, 10, 11, 200, 1000, and it goes on and on and on. So I guess we are done with whole numbers. The next one, let's look at natural or counting numbers. The next one, number two, is natural or counting numbers. Natural or counting numbers. Now, the natural or counting numbers, we denote them by N, by using the letter N. Now, these numbers are only the numbers you can count. Can you count negatives? No. Can you count negative 5? No. Can you count 0? No. Can you count 1? Yes, you can count 1. Can you count 200 people? Yes, you can count 200 people. So these are natural numbers or whole numbers. So we say that natural number in set notation, we have that natural number is a set of, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and we put the ellipsis as usual. 
because it goes on and on and on. You can count them. So, but in interval notation, in interval notation, how are we going to represent natural numbers in interval notation? Natural numbers will be, is going to be closed in one, because one is included. Remember, if it is a closed interval, that means it is included. If it is a closed interval, that means it is included. So it's going to be closed in one, and because it goes on and on and on, it's going to be open in infinity. So if I tell you to list natural numbers for me, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 200, 300, 400, 500, 10 million, and the rest of them. That is the natural or counting numbers. Inter set notation, interval notation. Now, in set notation, you have to write it using the correct symbol. You can practice this on your own. I will just illustrate it one time and then you practice it on your own. If you want to, be, if you want to write the beginning set notation, like this is n is a set of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, then the ellipsis. Some of you, for the first time, you might have problems practicing this, but if you want to begin to practice it, to write the beginning one, just come and make a line like this. Just make as if you're drawing the integral symbol. The integral. And then when you do it like this, you point your pencil or whatever you're using to draw, you point it here and you draw it like this. You just draw it down. The same thing if you want to make the ending symbol. You just do something like this. When you do something like that, then you use your pencil or whatever, and then you point it here and you make it like this. If you're writing set notation and you write parentheses or bracket, it is wrong. You must write the correct set notation. The first set of numbers we shall be talking about are the integers. The integers for we to understand it, let's look at a number line. When we draw a number line, a number line consists of the zero. To the right of the zero, you have the positive numbers. One, two, three, four, five. To the left of the zeros, you have the negative numbers. Negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four, negative five. Now, so this zero divides the negative numbers from the positive numbers. If you want, depending on the direction you want to go, if you want to go in this direction, you will see that 5 is greater than 4, 4 is greater than 3, 3 is greater than 2, 2 is greater than 1, 1 is greater than 0, 0 is greater than negative 1, negative 1 is greater than negative 2, in this direction. This is called the descending order. Descending order. I'm trying to teach number line because you will still need this knowledge uh, in other topics that we will cover. We still need this knowledge. So, if you're moving in this direction, it is called descending order. Descending order means from the greatest to the least. Or you can also move in this direction and this direction is called the ascending order. Ascending order. Ascending order means from the least to the greatest. Negative 5 is less than negative 4. Negative 4 is less than negative 3. Negative 3 is less than negative 2. Negative 2 less than negative 1. Negative 1 less than 0. 0 less than 1. And so on. The trend continues. All these numbers whole number values, whether it is positive or negative, and also zero, are what we call integers. Integers are represented by Z. Z. I like to write my Z with something in the middle. Why do I write my Z that way? Because some students 
Friday at Z, like two. This is the way I like writing my Z. I try to put something in the middle. Some students might write this. Some students write very fast. And uh, maybe they intended to write Z, but the instructor or the teacher might look at it and it looks like two. So, because of that, I try to put something in the middle so that my Z does not look at like two. This is the way I write it in mathematics. Now, not in other subjects. In English, I will still write my Z very well. But uh, it is up to you. It is not a fixed rule to write Z that way. But that is up to you, you know, so that the teacher or your instructor will not get confused. So, Z will consist, if I, were, if I was to write this in set notation, Z will be a set of, of course, it's from negative infinity, zero, then positive infinity. It includes zero as well. It includes zero. Zero is neither positive nor negative. Zero just divides positive numbers from negative numbers or negative numbers from positive numbers. Yeah, but it is not positive, it is not negative. So this will be, we put the ellipsis, the parenthesis, maybe you just add negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, and the ellipsis. This tells you that it continues from negative infinity, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, up to positive infinity. That is the set notation. Uh, in writing the set notation, I need to mention this. I guess I didn't mention it earlier. The set notation is not parentheses. It is not brackets. No. If you want to write it, and I will, I'm going to illustrate this probably one time, and then you can practice on your own. This is the way I teach my students to, to write the set notation. You first of all, with your pencil or pen or whatever you have, you do a sign like this. Just do a sign, just like the integral sign, integral, like this. And then, at this point again, at this point again, just draw it like this. This is the beginning set notation. Now, if you, want, if you were to write the ending set notation, you do the sign like this. Like this and then from here at this tip you draw it this way now you can do it I had problems initially writing it uh, the correct way but I practiced and that was the way I learned it so but I want to tell you something when your teacher or instructor says that you should write something in set notation don't use brackets or parentheses please don't if you don't, if you use brackets or parentheses, it's wrong. Uh, probably they will not mark it wrong, but I think it's wrong. Now, the interval notation will be Z is equal to from negative infinity to positive infinity. It should be open at both ends. It should be open at both ends because you are dealing with infinity. Uh, I guess I've explained that initially. So, uh, this is all about uh, the integers. Also, in some textbooks, when you see this Z subscript plus, you see this kind of symbol in some textbooks, where you have the integer and then you have a positive uh, plus sign as the subscript. This means the positive integers. These are, these are all positive integers. All positive integers. And then when you see the sign minus, these are now all negative integers. So let's kind of uh, be aware of, of it. That is what it means, positive and negative integers. Of course, the positive integers is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 10, 100. Uh, negative integers are negative 5, negative 200, negative 400, and so on. Alright, I hope you understood it. Uh, the next one we, we are going to write now is uh, 
Rational numbers. Rational. Number four. Rational numbers. Rational numbers. Rational numbers are represented by Q. Q. Now, ratio. Rational. Ratio. Rational. Ratio. Rational. Rational numbers are numbers that can be expressed as a ratio. Let's take for instance, you are familiar with fractions. Fractions are all ratios. Like when you have something like 3 over 4. You can call this ratio of 3 to 4. Or ratio of 3 is to 4. That is 3 is to 4. When you have a, when you have a 1 over 2, this is a ratio of 1 is to 2. So, wh when you have numbers, integers, that can be expressed as a ratio, it gives you rational numbers. But there are rules to that now. Not every ratio is a rational number. Not every ratio is a rational number. Uh, we are going to get to the rules. Now, when you have a ratio of, of positive integers, it gives you the positive rational, positive rational numbers. When you have a ratio of negative integers, it gives you uh, negative rational numbers. If they abide by the rules. What are the rules? The rules is that number one, we have some rules for rational numbers. Number one is that they must be like, they must be the, the decimal must repeat. You must have repeating decimals or terminating decimals. Okay? If it gives you a decimal, it must be terminating decimals or repeating decimals. Uh, decimals must be terminating. What do I mean by terminating decimals? What I mean by terminating decimals are decimals that don't go ad infinitum. I mentioned ad infinitum before. That's still infinity. It goes on and on and on and on. Like, let's, for instance, you have 3 divided by 4. 3 over 4. For instance, 3 over 4 is what? I think that's 0 0.75. Right? If you have something like 5 over 8, I think that is a 0 0.625. So it stops. These are terminating. It doesn't go on and on and on. Uh, this is a. This is. These are terminating decimals. Another thing, another rule is that the decimals, or the decimals must be repeating. Must be repeating. Now this goes for rational numbers. Okay, you can have terminating decimals. They are rational numbers. You can have repeating decimals, like if you have uh, something like 1 over 3. 1 over 3 will give you what? Uh, 0 0.3333 and so on. 3333333333. It keeps repeating in threes. 3333333. So actually, you kind of write it this way 0 0.3, and you have a bar sign. We call it bar. B A R. Bar sign. Zero point bar three. Zero point bar three or zero point three bar. Okay. Now this tells you that uh, it's a repeating decimal. It doesn't end, but it's repeating in the same number. Three 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 three. It can also be called a. Uh, they are also called rational numbers. Terminating or repeating decimal. Another, uh, another rational numbers are the integers. All, all integers are rational numbers. All integers. That's the third one. I've written two. Number three. All integers are rational numbers. All integers are rational numbers. Like I said earlier on, you can either have positive rational numbers. If you have positive integers, it gives you positive rational numbers. If you have negative integers, 
it will probably give you a negative rational number depending. Yeah. For instance, if you have a 3, 3 actually means what? 3 over 1. That is 3 is to 1. Ratio of 3 is to 1. So this is also a rational number. Right? Uh, if you have a negative 4, negative 4 still means negative 4 over 1. So this is, this is a positive rational number, 3 over 1. And then negative 4 over 1 is a negative rational number. So all integers are rational numbers. Uh, another one is that all, uh, all whole numbers are rational numbers. All whole numbers are rational numbers. You should know that. And then uh, all natural numbers are, are all natural numbers are rational numbers. So I think I've given you five types of five things that can, that could be called rational numbers. Uh, five things that could be called. Uh, if they are going to be decimals, then it, they should be repeating, or they should be terminating, or all integers are rational numbers, or all whole numbers are rational numbers, or uh, all uh, natural numbers are rational numbers as well. So that is uh, rational numbers. Right? I hope there's no question. If you have question, uh, let's do so. When we come to examples, uh, it will give you a better understanding. Yeah. Then the next one we are going to look at is irrational numbers. Irrational numbers. Irrational numbers. Now, these are numbers that cannot be expressed as a ratio of two numbers. Remember, natural, uh, remember, rational numbers are numbers that can be expressed as a ratio. Irrational numbers are numbers that cannot be expressed as a ratio. Irrational numbers. Now, there are two things that involve that you can call irrational numbers. There are two sets of numbers that you can call irrational numbers. Number one, if they are decimals, and the decimals are non-terminating, non-terminating, it doesn't end. It goes on and on and on and on and on. And then, like, if, if they don't terminate, and, and if they are not repeating, and if they are non-repeating, non-repeating. So these two classifications must be there for you to classify a number as irrational. If it's a, if it's a terminating decimal, it's already a rational number. If it is not a terminating decimal, you need to do two things. You need to check whether it is repeating or non-repeating. Now, I want you to uh, observe the difference between rational numbers and irrational numbers. For rational numbers, if the decimals, if you write a number as a fraction, you divide the number. If the decimals do not terminate, if they go on and on and on, then you check whether they are repeating or not. If they are repeating, then they are rational numbers. If they are not repeating, then they are irrational numbers. If the decimals terminate, they are rational numbers. Now, let me say it again. When you have a fraction or a ratio, you divide it. Or you divide it, it gives you a decimal. If the decimal terminates, let's say after three decimal places, two decimal places, four decimal places, if the decimals terminate, if it is finite, then you have it as a rational number. But if the decimal does not terminate, then you do two things. You do two checks. The first check is, is it repeating? If it is repeating, then it is, uh, it is a rational number. Repeating means repeating in the same number. 3, 3, 3, 3, 3. 
four, 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 five, 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 and the rest of them. But if it is not repeating, then it is an irrational number. Example, look at your pi. Pi is 22. Example, pi. This is pi, which is of course 22 over 7. Now, some people may ask that this is this can be expressed as a ratio. 22 is to 7. Yes, you can call it that way, but we still have to have check the decimals whether they are repeating or not. Now, 22 over 7 gives you uh, 3.142, and you keep going. It doesn't repeat. If you have a 10 digit calculator, it fills up the 10 digit. If you have a 12 digit calculator, and you do this in 12, in the 12, you do 22 divided by 7 in a 12 digit calculator, it fills it up. If you have a 16 digit calculator, it fills it up. So it doesn't end. More so, it does not have a repeating pattern. If this was 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, or 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, or 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2 then, it, then it will work. But this is 3.142. So we say it's irrational. Another example, another good example are uh, your radicals. Your radicals. If you have the square root of anything that is not a perfect square, that is an irrational number. I know some people will ask me, what do I mean by perfect square? Now, assuming you have square root of 2, square root of 2 gives you 1.414, and you keep going. This is an irrational number. It is not a rational number. It repeats, uh, it, it, is tammy, it is continuous and it does not repeat. It does not terminate, it does not repeat. So it is irrational. If you have square root of 3, square root of 5, they are all irrationals. Now, square root of 4 will give you 2. Square root of 4 is not an irrational number. 4 is a perfect square, and we will talk about perfect squares. So, square root of 4 gives you 2, and 2 means 2 over 1. 2 means 2 over 1. 2 is to 1. It's still 2. This is a rational number, not an irrational number. Square root of 9 gives you 3. This is a rational number. So, that is the way we know irrational numbers. The next set of numbers, fifth set of numbers, we are going to look at is real numbers. Sixth set of numbers, real numbers. Real numbers are denoted by R. I know some people might say my accent is about R. And they might want to make fun of me, but please don't make fun of me. Now, real numbers are denoted by R. Just like we have positive integers and negative integers, positive rational numbers and negative rational numbers, we also have uh, positive real numbers and negative real numbers. Somebody might, some student might ask, I did mention positive irrational and negative irrational. Yes, you do have positive irrational and negative irrational numbers as well. So, just like we have those, we still have positive real numbers and negative real numbers. What is a real number? A real number is any number that can be found on the number line. When you have the number line, of course, you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, negative 4, negative 5, and so on. Any number that can be found here is a real number. Decimals, fractions, rational numbers, irrational numbers, whole numbers, natural numbers. They are all real numbers. All of them are real numbers. Anything that can be found here. You can find 1 over 2 here. 1 over 2 is in between. You can find 1 over 5, which is 0 0.2. It's around here. You can find... You can find square root of uh, 5 here. Gives you 2 point something. You can find it here. So, any number that can be found on the number line is a real number. It consists of all these numbers I've talked about. 
including fractions, decimals, they are all real numbers. And just like you have positive integers and negative integers, you have arrow plus, positive real numbers, arrow minus, negative real numbers. Okay? So those are the real numbers. All numbers that can be found on the real number line are real numbers. Number seven, we have even numbers. Even numbers. Now, even numbers are n numbers that can be divided by two. Numbers, and any number that can be divided by two. Any number that can be divided can be divided by two. Of course, so you have like, or you can say just multiples of two are all even numbers. Or, or, all multiples of two. All multiples of two. Right? You can say it that way. Any number that can be divided by two. So, two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, you know this, this is not it. It's not difficult. Even numbers. The next one we have odd numbers. Odd numbers are numbers that cannot be divided by two. Numbers that cannot be divided by two without a remainder. By two without a remainder. That means if two divides it, there must be a remainder. If two divides any odd number, then there must be a remainder. There must be a remainder. <laughs> it cannot be divided by two without a remainder. So these are odd numbers like one, three, five, seven, nine, and the rest of them. Okay. Uh, the next one we have here is are the prime numbers. Now, for even numbers, I say that numbers that can be divided by two, or you can say all multiples of two, then Odd numbers, numbers that cannot be divided by 2 without a remainder. Or you can also say all non-multiples of 2. All non-multiples of 2. All non-multiples of 2. They are odd numbers. Alright, the next one we are going to look at is prime numbers. Prime numbers. Now, I would like you to pay very close attention here. You know, some students uh, have difficulty in understanding this. But I'm going to explain this real good now. Prime numbers are numbers that can be divided by only itself and one without a remainder. These are numbers that can be divided by only itself and one without a remainder, without a remainder. So this means that if any other number divides that, no that, that number, Without a remainder, then that means it's not a prime number. If you bring out a number, you divide it by one, you divide it by itself. If you divide it by any other number and it does not give you a remainder, then that number is not a prime number. But if you divide it by any other number and it gives you a remainder, that number is a prime number. Note, one is not a prime number. Let's start from there. One is not a prime number. A prime number. Let's start with, let's look at two. Two. Two divided by one will give you two. That's good. That divided by only itself and one. Two divided by two itself will give you one. That's good. Now, but if you divide 2 by any other number, you will have a remainder. 
Remainder means you have a decimal. Now, some people might think, what is remainder? Remainder is when you now have a decimal point. Decimal point. Like if you divide 2 by 3, it gives you 0 0.6667. Of course, this is 0 0.6 bar. Repeating this, uh, this is repeating decimal. Repeating decimal, remember, is a rational number. And I said, I, I talked about using bar. When it repeats, you, you just use bar. You can keep writing all those things. Yeah. Um, so this is a repeating decimal. If you divide 2 by any other number, if you divide 2 by 4, it gives you 0 0.5. Now, 2 divided by 4. Some students make the mistake and write 4 divided by 2. Or some students can simply use a calculator to do this. All you need to do is bring your calculator and just do 2 divided by 4 equal to. Alright, or even just use the division 4 into 2. 0 0.25 0 0.5 so which th that, that tells you that 2 is a prime number because any other number that 2 divided by 5 will give you a 0 0.4 2 divided by 6 will give you like 0 0.3 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3 and the rest of them so, <coughs> so that tells you that 2 is a prime number because 2 can be divided by only 1 and 2 only 1 and itself or itself and 1 Without a remainder. So 2 is a prime number. So we say that 2, two is a prime number. Let's look at 3. 3 divided 1 is 3. That's good. 3 divided 3 is 1. That's good. But if you do 3 divided by 4, or 3 divided by 2, it gives you a 1.5. If you do 3 divided by 4, it gives you 0 0.75. So any other number, if you do 3 divided by 5, it gives you 0 0.6. Now any other number you divide by 3, any other number you that divides 3 or that you divide by 3 will give you any other number that divides 3. I'm sorry, any other number that divides 3. Right? Or that is divided, or that is divided by three. Yeah, yeah. Check the nomenclature. Any other number that divides three, or that is divided by three, will give you a remainder. That tells you that three is a prime number. Three is a prime number. I would like you to pay great attention to this because it's important. Students find it difficult, and why I'm specifying more time on this is because you need it. 4, let's look at 4. Let's see whether 4 is a prime number. Okay, 4 divided by 1 is 4, good. 4 divided by 4 is 1, that's good. But hold on a minute. Now, if you say 4 divided by 2, it gives you 2. And that makes it bad. Because you still have a number that can also divide 4 and does not give a remainder. For prime number, it is only that number and 1 that can divide it without a remainder. Any other number that divides it must have a remainder. But for the case of 4, 2 can also divide 4 and it won't give you a remainder. It gives you 2. Because of that, 4 is not a prime number. 4 is not a prime number. So, I would like you to list other prime numbers. Other prime numbers now. Can you list other prime numbers? Of course, you have What's the next prime number? You have 5. 6 is not a prime number because 6 can be divided by 2, which gives you 3. 6 can be divided by 3, which gives you 2. Those are not remainders, so 6 is not. 7 is. 8 is not because 8 can be divided by 4 and 2. Now, 9 is not. 9 is not. 9 is an odd number, but it is not a prime number because 9 can be divided by 3. Which gives you 3. 10 is not. 10 can be divided by 2 and 5. 11 is. 13 is. And so on. Prime numbers. The next set of numbers we'll be doing are the composite numbers. Composite numbers are very easy. 
composite numbers. Composite numbers are numbers that are not prime. Composite numbers are numbers that are not prime numbers. That are not prime numbers. Just like saying that opposite of prime numbers are composites. Numbers that are not prime numbers. So you can have a 4, 6, uh, 8, 9, and the rest of them. That's primes and composites. Opposite of primes are composites. Then the next set of numbers we'll be looking at. Number 11, perfect squares. Perfect squares. We are coming to the end of these numbers now. Perfect squares. Now, this case of numbers, a lot of textbooks don't write it, but I want to mention it. Some textbooks don't call it types of numbers or sets of numbers. But I want to mention it because it is important. In, as you go on some study in mathematics, you will know the difference of two squares then you know that this is important. Now, what are perfect squares? They are squares of integers. Squares of integers. Whether positive or negative integers. For instance, if you say 1 squared will give you 1 times 1, which is 1. 2 squared, 2 times 2, which is 4. 3 squared, 3 times 3, which is 9. 4 squared will give you 16. 5 squared, 25, 6 squared, 36, 7 squared, 49, and you go on, 64, 81, 100, all these are perfect squares, 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, 36, 49, 64, 81, 100, 121, 144, 169, and the rest of them. Even if you do negative 1 all squared, it gives you negative 1 times negative 1, which is 1. Negative 2 all squared gives you negative 2 times negative 2, which is 4. Negative 3 all squared gives you negative 3 times negative 3, which is 9. It's still perfect squares, squares of integers. Perfect cubes. Perfect cubes are cubes of integers, whether they are positive integers or negative integers. Perfect cubes. That's the next number we are doing. So this is 1 cube, 2 cube, 3 cube, 4 cube, and the rest of them. I guess I'll just stop at 4 cube. Or 5 cube, 6 cube, and the rest of them. This is negative 1 cube, negative 2 cube, negative 3 cube, and the rest of them. Now, 1 cube is 1 times 1 times 1, 1. 2 times 2 times 2, 8. You have this 27, 64, 125, 216, and the rest of them. These are perfect cubes. Cubes of integers. Now, what happens when you do the negatives? These are not the, this, you know, perfect cubes have, have both the positive and negative. Because when you square any integer, whether you square a positive integer or a negative integer, it gives you a positive number. But when you cube any integer, you have both the positive numbers and the negative numbers. If you have negative 1 cube, negative 1 cube gives you negative 1 times negative 1 times negative 1, which is negative 1. Negative 2 cube gives you negative 2 times negative 2 times negative 2, which is negative 8. Negative 3 cube, negative 3 times negative 3 times negative 3, which is negative 27. Negative 64. Negative uh, 125, negative 216, 18, 27, 64, 125, 216. All these are perfect cubes. Perfect cubes. Cubes of integers. Oh, I didn't even write it. Cubes of integers. Cubes of integers. All these are perfect cubes. All of them here are perfect cubes. 1, negative 1, 8, negative 8, 27, negative 27, 64, negative 64, and the rest of them. They are all perfect cubes. And the last set of numbers that we would like us to talk about are the complex numbers. The last set of numbers. 
complex numbers. Complex numbers are numbers that they are imaginary numbers. Are imaginary numbers? Imaginary numbers. That's number one. Number two, they cannot be found on the real plane. Cannot be found on the real plane. So if they cannot be found on the real plane, what plane do you think you can find them? On the complex plane. Can be found on the complex plane. On the complex plane. So let's let's talk about this, although I'm, I'm just going to mention it. Real numbers. Any number that can be found on the real plane. You have natural numbers, whole numbers, integers, fractions, decimals, even numbers, odd numbers, prime numbers, perfect squares, perfect cubes, rational numbers, irrational numbers. All of them are real numbers. But they are real. But we also have a set of numbers we call imaginary. They are not real. They are imaginary numbers. For instance, you will have that square root of 4 is 2. So square root of 4 is 2. Right? This is a rational number. But what if we have square root of negative 4? If you take your calculator and you punch in square root negative 4, it will give you error. Error. This is what it will give you. Error. Sometimes books will write infinity. Well, in mathematics, we say that this will give you 2i. Sometimes books will write it as 2j. Now, square root of negative numbers will give you complex numbers. Now, when you have cube root of negative 8, no problem. Cube root of negative 8 is what? Negative 2. No problem. This is not a complex number. It's not a complex number. It's not a complex number. This is a rational number. Cube root of negative 8 is a rational number. But when you have square root of negative numbers, square root of negative 1, of course we refer this as i. We have square root of negative 2, square root of negative 3, square root of negative 4, and the rest of them. This gives you complex numbers. Because this will now be square root of 2 times square root of negative 1. And you can call this square root of 3 times square root of negative 1. You can call this square root of 4 times square root of negative 1. And this will give you i square root of 2 i squared of 3, this will give you 2i. Okay, but, I mean, don't, if you don't understand how I did this, don't worry, don't worry yourself about it. I mean, I, 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 I'm just trying to mention to you that we have another set of numbers we call complex numbers. Uh, thank you so much for listening. I think I've come to the end of this presentation. Numbers, set notations, and interval notations. I hope you had a very good viewing. Uh, if you have questions as usual, please uh, go to my website and ask your questions or make your comments on the YouTube as well. Now, the next thing that is important I would want to talk about is the moment of moment of conscience is summed on. I always try to talk, talk something about this at the end of every video. Now, imagine that um, the world, as you know, is we have inequality in this world. I mean, we have people that have, we have people who do not have, we have people who have so much, we have people who, I mean, do not have at all. You know, uh, and you know, the world is also unequal. We have some areas are very good, they have good weather, 
they don't have natural disasters. Some areas they have earthquakes and people die, they lose their homes and the rest of them. And we don't want to ask questions too much. Why the world is not equal? I mean, why the world is unequal or, or inequality? Why the world is unequal? Or why there are natural disasters? There are so many questions that if you keep asking and asking and asking, uh, I think you, you just uh, go into philosophy and uh, you probably you probably will not find answers to them anyway. Something just happens in this world. Now, I want us, you thank yourself, count yourself as being lucky. You are alive, you're breathing, you have something to eat, you have something to drink. You have something that, okay, I mean, if you want to go, you can easily go out. Count yourself very lucky. But please and please remember, there is someone out there who doesn't have now, I came to United States and people here, I mean, you live well. I mean, some people do live well. But there are some other people who still don't have that love, don't have that joy, don't have someone to care for them. There are some kids that they, they have never experienced the love of parenting. And it is not their fault. Somebody brought them into this world. Now, I don't think they had that choice of being, of coming into this world. They don't have the choice. <laughs> they don't. A man and a woman came together and brought that kid into this world. And, it's the, and it, it is the responsibility of that man or woman, a man and woman, not just a woman, to take care of the kid that they brought into this world. Now, but because people deviate from their responsibilities, it doesn't happen that way. Some people are not just responsible or something might happen and they were not fortunate enough to raise that kid or raise that child. And please don't try and don't mind my accent when I pronounce child. Let it not deviate from the moment of conscience. This is very important because when I pronounce child, some people might deviate about it now. So what I'm saying is that let us consider those who are less privileged, those who don't have anything, those who have not felt that love of a parent, those who don't have the money to feed, the money to play, to work, to enjoy the good things of life. I would like to commend some churches, some charity organizations, that have been to Haiti so far to help the, uh, the kids, the people there. And I really thank you. I say a big thank you to you. Right? And I'm also encouraging other people, please, help the people in need. A lot of people in Haiti, they don't have anything to eat. They don't have anything to drink. They don't have anywhere to sleep. And even here in America, we still have people who have not been privileged to find the love of a, a mother, to find the love of a father. Please show them love. When you give, you leave. Remember this, when you give, you leave. I repeat it again, when you give, you leave. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day. Bye.